Okay, I can. I think we can go ahead and start. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Junaid Ilmaz. I'm uh, uh, a board member in the Clearwater Audubon Society. Uh, we are we are lucky to have uh, Paul Trunk tonight. Uh, he's been a uh, naturalist, born naturalist. His he has served in uh, many positions in the Clearwater Audubon in the past. Uh, he was the Clearwater, uh, not actually North Pinellas. Uh, uh, CBC compiler up until last, last year. Now he started, he retired, so he's enjoying the life. <laughs> and he's going, he knows everything. He know, he's into butterflies, he's into dragonflies. So just, uh, uh, he is a wealth of knowledge and, and uh, hopefully we'll share some of his uh, views and experiences tonight. Uh, before we go further, a few reminders. Uh, if you have a question, please uh, type it in the QA uh, button down there. If you don't see it, you should be able to uh, make it appear by put, pushing that uh, bubble. Uh, and uh, Paul might uh, elect to answer them during the conversation, during his uh, presentation, or we'll possibly wait until the end uh, to answer all the questions. Um, I think at this point, I'll just uh, give it to Paul. Take it to Paul. Awesome. Uh, Great, thank you. Thank you, Junaid. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, can you see, still see my picture or do you see just the full screen? We see your picture and we see the screen, your presentation too. Okay, so how do I minimize the screen? So if you can, uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. You can go to your video on the right uh, upper corner. There is a stop video. Temporarily, you can stop that one. Right upper corner of your own personal video. There right. are three, but you need to move your uh, cursor there. You need to move your mouse there. And there are three buttons show up. Which is more? Yeah, if you click on the three buttons, you see you see a uh, menu. Yep, more. Okay. On your video. Oh, not your shared video, your personal uh, on the right hand side. It looks okay. We can see the video. We like you. We like, we like to see you. That's fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. I think we're good. All right. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So uh, for a while now, I've been thinking about this would really make for a good presentation. Uh, all about the Sonoran Desert. Um, it's one of the unique habitats we have in North America, and people love visiting the Sonoran Desert to go bird watching. I personally have been there probably a dozen times. Uh, the first time I visited the Sonoran Desert was back in 1988, and it, uh, it was really a beautiful experience. It's just a great place to go birding. And um, it's just, the desert, it just has such unique qualities about it that you just don't find anywhere else. So let's talk a little bit about why we have deserts in the first place. Uh, the earth, is tilted about 23 and a half degrees, but that doesn't prevent the sun from hitting the equator at about a 90 degree angle. So this really is the start of everything that happens on the earth, our weather, uh, different land formations, it all, it all starts with the sun hitting the earth. And the fact that the earth is tilted is what gives us our seasons. And if the earth wasn't tilted, we wouldn't have seasons, but nevertheless, we would still have these major uh, biomes, which we'll talk about in just a minute, that are found across North America. So the sun hits the earth at the equator, pretty much at a 90 degree angle. And what happens at the equator is the air starts to rise. Hot air rises, it heats up, it cools, and then it falls to the earth as rain along the tropical rainforest. But what's interesting at the equator is there's no wind. It's called the doldrums. And there's, um, so the air, doesn't, the air doesn't move at the equator, it just rises. It ri heats up, rises, 
forms these huge clouds. The, the clouds kind of drift north and south of the equator. And then down comes the rain after the, after the air is condensed, forms these huge, uh, uh, tremendous rainfall. And that's what supports the tropical rainforests, which are north and south of the equator. So as this air falls um, back down to earth, it dries out. All this, all this moisture from the air dries out after it's dumped its rain on these tropical rainforests. And then what happens? It, um, it eventually makes its, it, it travels up, this dry air rises. Uh, it's rising at the zero equator. It, the air falls again at 30 degrees north and south latitudes, where it says the horse latitudes. The air, so the air rises at zero degrees, circulates, dumps its rain, circulates, and then the air starts to cool and it falls back to earth at 30 degrees north and south latitude. And that air is very dry because it's dumped its rain uh, on the way to uh, getting to 30 degrees north and south. So that's why we have most of the deserts of the world or the great deserts of the world are found at 30 degrees north and south latitude. Because even though the air is cool and it's falling back to earth, it's extremely dry. So that's why, um, that's why we have um, uh, such uh, the, the major deserts of the world at, at those latitudes. It all starts with the sun heating the earth at the equator and causing air in motion. And once the air starts to move, then things start to happen. And those are called, the, you'll, you'll notice on, this, on the screen at 30 degrees north and south, those are called the horse latitudes. And the reason why those are called the horse latitudes is because when the sailors were sa sailing uh, ships way back when, if they got caught at 30 degrees north and south latitude, there was no wind either because the air was just falling to the earth. It wasn't moving north and south or east to west. It was just falling. And so the ships used to get caught in the 30 degrees north and south latitudes, and they would get stuck there. They couldn't feed their horses, so the horses got thrown overboard because they had to save the food for the men on board. So those are called the horse latitudes. The equator is called the doldrums because there's no wind at the equator. So that's why, generally speaking, why we have our major deserts at 30 degrees north and south latitude uh, in the world on Earth. So North America has six major biomes or seven major biomes uh, in it. The desert is one of them, grasslands, deciduous forests, the boreal forest or the taiga, the desert, the coastal plains, tundra, and the rainforest. And you see where the deserts are, they're in that kind of a yellowy color. And they're all right around 30 degrees north and south latitude, or excuse me, 30 degrees north latitude. And we'll talk a little bit about some exceptions to that, but those that's generally where our deserts are. When we think of the West, we think of dry uh, deserts. Um, and there's one state that actually has three of these major biomes that crisscross it, but uh, that's a topic for another, another discussion. And of course, the more biomes you have in your area, the greater diversity of plants, animals, and all kinds of wildlife. So, um, You'll notice that the, the grasslands really do cover up such a kind of that pink area. The Great Plains cover up a large area of North America and all has to do with just the lack of rainfall, but it doesn't get, um, it gets more rainfall than the deserts do. So, so here are the four major deserts of the world of North America. Um, you can, I've got Las Vegas pointed out there because Las Vegas sits at about 30, 30, 36 degrees latitude. So it kind of sits kind of in the middle of these four major deserts. Uh, the Great Basin Desert to the north, the Mojave Desert, um, the Sonoran Desert, which kind of shore, uh, forms a horseshoe shape around uh, Arizona, a little bit into California, down to almost all of Baja California is considered the Sonoran Desert, and then on into the Sonoran region of Mexico. And then we have the Chihuahuan Desert that's found in Texas, New Mexico, and then the Ch Chihuahuan area of Mexico. Uh, Big Bend National Park is all part, is all Chihuahuan Desert. Um, and you start to get a flavor of the Chihuahuan Desert uh, in a little bit of Eastern Arizona, uh, 
but uh, mainly it's the Sonoran Desert where people go birding, uh, bird watching. It's uh, it's all the it's typically Sonoran Desert. But those are the four major deserts in, in uh, North America. Now, the Great Basin is really, uh, when we think of deserts, we really don't think of the, the uh, Great Basin as a desert. But the reason why it's a desert is because it sits between two mountain ranges. The, to the east, it's got the, the Rocky Mountains. And to the west, it's got the Sierra Nevadas. So as the weather and the wind and the air moves off the Pacific Ocean on land, it rises on the western slopes of mountain ranges. And as it rises, of course, it cools, it condenses, and then falls. So the western side of mountain ranges are usually uh, wetter. They have a, a, a bigger variety of plants, uh, taller plants, taller trees, a more lush habitat. You get over the mountaintop and you start to move east, and it becomes a little bit more desolate. It's just not as rich a habitat uh, as the western part of mountain slopes. But the great, the, that area in Nevada, Utah, and so forth, they sit right within um, two mountain ranges. So it's really a desert type of uh, climate. Some people call it the high desert, but the Great Basin. It, it, and it has plants and animals unique to that that you don't find in the Sonoran or the Chihuahuan or the Mojave Desert. But it is the largest desert actually we have in North America is the Great Basin. So there are plants that are unique to each one of these desert uh, areas. Um, in the Chihuahuan Desert, you've got mesquite. In the Great Basin, there's sage. It's covered with sage trees. And of course, a saguaro cactus in the Sonoran Desert. Uh, the Joshua tree is sort of the signature plant of the Mojave Desert. And I put the cardone in there. The cardone is the really the signature plant of the Sonoran Desert that's found in Baja California, in Baja California, which is really Mexico. Um, it's very similar, has very similar uh, a structure to it. It grows very tall, very big. But the thing is with the Cardone is they don't form arms like the uh, Suaro cactus does. And we're gonna talk tonight about uh, the, mainly the Suaro cactus. Um, it's really the signature plant of the Sonoran Desert. And I think once we go through things, you'll be amazed that there's even swarrow cactus that exist because of its the strategies it needs and what it needs and requirements it needs to survive is really pretty remarkable. But those are really the four major plants of the North American deserts. Uh, but of course, um, there's a lot more plants, but we don't have enough time to go through all those. But these are really the signature plants of the, of the deserts of North America. So we're gonna spend some time talking about some cactus and mainly about the saguaro cactus. All cactus are succulents, meaning they have kind of a waxy uh, a coating to them. Um, they're nearly endemic to the new world and that means um, they're only found in North, and, uh, North America, some in South America, uh, Europe and Asia, they don't really have cactus, although there's a few cactus, I think, that are native to Madagascar. Um, but generally speaking, cactus are just basically uh, found only in the New World. All cactus must produce a flower in order to uh, reproduce. Um, and there's over 300 species of cactus alone in the Sonoran Desert. So let's talk a little bit about the, um, the saguaro cactus. It's really restricted to southeastern Arizona. Tucson has two areas that are covered in, in saguaro cactus, and they've both been made into national parks. It's uh, saguaro National Park East and saguaro National Park West. And uh, it's really one of the most magnificent uh, habitats you can experience. And, Arizonans are really proud of their cactus and they just are really proud of the saguaro cactus. So the range is almost entirely in Southern Arizona, the Southern the saguaro cactus. There's a few um, places in California where you can find it, um, but it's mostly restricted to Southern Arizona. So when you watch Westerns on TV and you see these cowboys going through the, 
the West, you can kind of tell what part of the West they're in based on uh, where they're traveling. You can see the Joshua trees, you might be able to see swirl cactus, they're going through mesquite um, areas, you have an idea where, where the, where the um, movie was being filmed. So they're covered in a waxy skin, very kind of thick waxy skin that restricts water loss. Their surface is folded into ribs. You can kind of see that on the picture. Um, they're 90% water. They're extremely heavy. They weigh about 80 pounds per foot. They have a tap root that's about two feet deep and that's all. But then they have smaller roots that radiate out. And those smaller roots um, capture any sort of rain that falls. But it doesn't have a very extensive root system at all. And that's true of most of uh, uh, most uh, plants in the desert. The root system is very, very shallow because it needs to catch all that rain it can. And the evaporation rate is so high that when it rains, water evaporates very quickly. It doesn't soak into the soil like, uh, like it does say in the Great Plains where the plants in the Great Plains, their root system is 10, 20 feet deep. And, uh, uh, because they would get heavy rains in the, along in the grasslands and that soil was just so rich it would stay in, it would just soak in and the roots were very deep. Plus they would tap water that was deep underground too, some of those grasses and plants in the Great Plains. But that's not the case in the desert. It's a, it's a feast or famine in the desert when it comes to rainfall. So, and they weigh anywhere between seven to 10 tons. So they're extremely, extremely heavy plants. They flower um, around mid-May um, mid to June. And then the top picture there shows the, uh, what the flower of the cactus looks like. Um, they grow extremely slow in their first few years. Uh, when, they're, when, they're, uh, when their seeds are germinated. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it takes about 10 years for a saguaro cactus to grow an inch and a half. So their growth rate is extremely slow. The, flower, the flowers on top of the uh, saguaro cactus appear when they get to be about eight feet tall, which is about when they're about 55 or 60 years old. That's before they could even start to reproduce. So it's an extremely old plant, um, grows very slowly, but um, it's just a magnificent looking plant. They always turn, uh, their arms are always turned upward. Uh, they start to grow arms when they're about 50 or, or 60, 70 years old. That's when the arms start to form. Um, some, they always grow upward. Uh, if there's any drooping arms on a plant, it's usually caused because of frost, frost damage. Um, their seeds form in mid-July and they form about 2,000 tiny little seeds from their fruit. Their flowers open at, late at night until midday and they smell like melon. And a, a major uh, pollinator of these saguaro cactus is bats. So that's why the flowers open it in the evening. It allows the bats to come in and pollinate these flowers. But the bats come in and they don't stay. They just come, they fly by, they stick out their tongue and off they go. They never land on the plant. And there are some places in, um, in Southeast Arizona where they feed hummingbirds, they'll keep their hummingbird feeders out at night. Some of them will keep a couple hummingbird feeders out at night. And you can watch the bats come in and feed off the hummingbird feeders. And they're large bats. They come in, take a stick out their tongue, grab a, some nectar out of the hummingbird feeder or the plant and then off they go. And that's how these are pollinated. And you can see the picture in the lower left, they show some white winged doves, which are feeding on the fruit or eating the fruit off the, um, off the tip of the swirl cactus. And really the seeds are the only moist food available before the monsoon, be, monsoon season begins in, 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 uh, in the Sonoran Desert. So these seeds are extremely, extremely important part of the ecosystem. 
and the swarrow cactus supports so much life because of, of uh, these seeds and the fruit that it produces. Um, so once the seeds drop, the vast majority of the seeds in the swarrow cactus um, dry out or else during the winter, they uh, desiccate because of frost. So most of the seeds don't survive. Um, some of the seeds are eaten by rodents. Some of the seeds are eaten by birds. Um, uh, the ones that do survive usually are located underneath what's called the nurse plant. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, what a nurse plant is. But most of the seeds don't survive on a swirl cactus. Um, another thing, before the seeds germinate, they need about five or more consecutive years of milder and wetter than average weather before the seeds will even germinate. So the seeds that do survive sit on the ground, they sit underneath this nurse plant, and they sit there for five years. And if the moisture is just right, if the temperatures are just right, then they'll start to germinate. And then, like I said earlier, it takes 10 years before they even grow an inch and a half. So this is a very, very slow process. So a few times each century, these conditions are met where there's enough rain and enough milder uh, temperatures for, this to, for these seeds to germinate. And the last time that happened was in the 1980s. So in the, the, about the year 2030 is when they expect that these plants will have gotten taller than their nurse plants and then be on their way to uh, becoming full-fledged uh, swarrow cactus. And that group of plants that, uh, that uh, germinated back in the 1980s, is, those plants are called cohorts. So when you look in this, when you look in through uh, uh, a desert, uh, a saguaro forest, so to speak, you'll notice that a lot of the plants are the same size. And that's because they all tend to grow in, in groups and they grow all at the same time, maybe once or twice or three times a century, when the conditions are just right for these seeds to germinate. So, you know, it is a, it is a slow, slow process. So this is a nurse plant. This is a plant called a Palo Verde, and we'll talk about Palo Verdes um, in a few minutes too, how important that is. And if you look at the very top of that, so that's a swirl cactus that's emerging through the uh, nurse plant of a of a Palo Verde. So a nurse plant really is just a plant where the seed is landed at the base of the plant and it offers it protection, protection from animals, birds, um, the heat, um, and so forth. So this is a uh, uh, Palo Verde. And if you look at the top of that picture, the swallow uh, of the uh, swallow cactus, uh, that's probably a big bunch, that big green bunch there is probably mistletoe. And mistletoe is another a plant that's very um, um, uh, important to the desert environment. The uh, phainopepla, a desert bird, uh, eats the fruit off the phainopepla. So, but that's a Palo Verde. So there's animals that use a swarrow cactus. The elf owl uses it as a nesting uh, habitat, as does the uh, gilded flicker or great horned owls. Uh, Harris's hawk uses it to, as perches because there's no really no tall trees in the desert. This, these are the tallest structures in the desert. Um, and they'll, Harris's hawk, as you know, they hunt in groups, but they'll sit on the top of the uh, other swirl cactus and use that as a perch. Uh, woodpeckers uh, peck holes in the swirl cactus. It doesn't seem to really cause much damage to the cactus, although uh, sometimes it can. It, it can kill the cactus. but um, um, the gilded flicker is really the flicker of the uh, Sonoran Desert. And of course, the little elf owl, which is the smallest owl, um, it's the smallest owl in the world, actually, but it's, uh, it's not much bigger than a large sparrow. And it, it uh, uses a um, swirl cactus as a, as a nesting hole, along with telephone poles and uh, anything else. But it's a cavity nester. Whereas a great horned owl just builds a nest in the arms of the... Um, of the swirl cactus. But it's very important. It's very, very important to the environment of the, um, of the Sonoran Desert. Like I said, the seeds are really the only moisture 
that these animals can eat until the monsoon rains show up uh, in mid-July. So the other, some other types of cactus are called barrel cactus. Um, there's, these are examples of uh, a fish hook barrel cactus. Um, there's some, you can see their hooks or their spines on the cactus are shaped like fish hooks. The spines are really just modified leaves. You know, this is a, a, a plant, leaves or modified leaves are, are what make up the spine on the cactus. Um, and there's pin cushion and other types of uh, barrel cactus, but they're very common. The picture that's up in the upper right shows the flowers that are, are blooming on that cactus. So all cactus have to produce flowers and they all have to get pollinated and reproduce by producing fruit and then seeds. And then those seeds fall to the ground. And hopefully over many, many years, the cactus, these uh, seeds germinate and cactus gets reproduced again. So another type of cactus that we have out in the desert is the choya, very common, different types of choya. These are kind of three of the most common choya. The top is the jumping choya and the teddy bear choya. And then on the left is the staghorn choya. And uh, jumping choya is called jumping choya because the limbs of the choya break off so easily that if you walk near it, it seems to just jump out at you and attach itself to your clothing. Uh, I've never had that happen because I'm really careful when I'm around choya plants. But um, yeah, they're very, very sticky and that's how they transport themselves. Um, but choya is a very, very common plant to find out in the um, Sonoran Desert. And you can't talk about these uh, choyas unless you talk about the cactus wren, which is the state bird of Arizona. Um, they nest several times between March and September, and they orientate their nests in these choya trees. Sometimes they build a dummy nest, uh, and then they'll build a real nest but they orientate their nests in tune with the seasons. And their bulky twig structures uh, have a side entrance that curves towards the inner chamber uh, when they're, uh, during the hot months, the wren will face the opening to receive the afternoon breeze. Um, a cactus wren building a nest in early March will orientate the entrance away from the cold winds of that season and they keep their chicks nice, snug and warm, deep within that nest. But uh, cactus wren's very common out in the Sonoran Desert. Again, it's a state bird of, state bird of Arizona, but they use the choya uh, cactus almost exclusively uh, as for their nesting habitat. And they do so um, uh, a couple of times a year and they change their nest around depending on which way the wind is blowing. So, so that's some of the strategies that uh, some of these cactus have. Um, there's other plants in the desert and they use all use some types of birth control because uh, it's all based on, on rainfall. There's grasses in the, in the Sonoran Desert. Uh, the grasses sometimes don't, the seeds of the grasses won't germinate um, until 10, maybe 15 days after a rainfall because the seeds kind of want to sit around and wait to see if there's sufficient amount of rain for them to germinate. And if there's not, then they won't germinate. But they wait and see, they just don't uh, jump at the chance to germinate at the first rainfall. They've got to have enough rainfall that's going to sustain them uh, as they grow and develop. Um, a lot of grasses out there do, um, in the desert have that strategy. Um, some plants like the Palo Verde have uh, very hard shells uh, on their seeds and they will not germinate until the seeds get washed down uh, during the heavy rains and the heavy rains crack these seeds open along the rocks or along rocks, uh, some really tough structures. And that allows then the seeds to germinate because there must be enough rain uh, falling that's gonna cause these seeds to uh, tumble down these arroyos and uh, crack open. And therefore there must be sufficient amount of rain for the seeds to germinate. And other plants have seeds that have growth inhibitors in them. So why would a plant uh, have a growth inhibitor in the seed? Why, why would they produce a seed that's 
that has in, uh, something that's going to prevent it from growing. Well, what happens is the seed, um, if there's enough rainfall, it washes these growth inhibitors away. And then, then that kind of triggers the seed to say, ah, there must be an, enough rain for me then that I can germinate and grow. So there's all these different uh, strategies of you want to call birth control, but that's um, that's what these that's what these plants use. And you know, water is essential for all these plants out in the desert. That's the number one thing that plants need to grow is water. So um, the water has to move from their roots to their leaves, and about 98% of the water that moves from the roots of a plant up through its leaves probably gets lost in a process called transpiration. And transpiration is just um, underneath the leaf of a plant, there's little openings called stomates. And that's sort of where the air gets, where the moisture um, and all the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the oxygen leaves the plant and uh, through these stomates. And that's also sometimes where carbon dioxide gets taken in. So plants are really essential. They produce oxygen and uh, take in carbon dioxide. And the same is true of these desert plants. They all do the same thing. There's really three types of plants uh, uh, in, the, in the plant kingdom. There's hydrophytes, which, uh, have an abund which live in abundance of water, uh, lilies, um, plants you find uh, living in lakes, streams, along the banks of water. Uh, those would be hydrophytes. Mesophytes are kind of plants that we think of, kind of the medium conditions of water, like trees and the plants in your backyard and so forth. And then there's xerophytes, which uh, uh, exist with a very limited water supply. So in the Sonoran Desert, in any desert, actually, the plants, we would all consider them to be xerophytes. So they have a limited water supply. But you can find uh, water um, supplies in the desert. You see these tall trees, uh, cottonwoods, but they only grow along rivers. And uh, there's uh, the San Pedro River, a very famous river that goes through Southeast Arizona. It's just lined with these tall cottonwood trees, but the cottonwood trees could never survive if it wasn't for that river. And uh, so, so the Palo Verde, the Palo Verde is a legume and legumes are really important to the desert. This is a really important plant. Um, it's called a green stick. Palo Verde, Verde meaning green, because it actually has chlorophyll in the trunk and the limbs of its, uh, on, a, on this plant, not only in the leaves. The Palo Verde will actually lose its leaves during the dry season, um, and it produces these seed pods, and a lot of um, desert plants, creosote, mesquite, Palo Verde, I um, uh, believe ironwood, those are really uh, very four of the most common plants and bushes you'll see out in the desert, and they're all legumes. They all produce legumes. And plants really need um, a couple things to grow. They need water, obviously, but they also need nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Um, and they can't use um, a nitrogen that's found in our air. Our atmosphere is about 78% nitrogen but nitrogen is really important for the formation of protein. So these plants, in order for their, uh, their, their seeds to contain a sufficient amount of protein, uh, they have to somehow get this nitrogen out of the air. And what they do is they have bacteria on their roots that can grab uh, the nitrogen out of the air and sort of fix that nitrogen. And it becomes part of the plant then. And, um, then as the plant grows and produces these seeds, there's plenty of nitrogen around that it can produce seeds that have protein. And if you're not a carnivore living in the desert, you have to get protein. And they do it by eating these, these animals, eat, it, eat these seed pods and the seeds that fall out of, the, uh, out of these plants, these legume plants that are found in the desert. So there's a lot of bushes, they don't get very tall, but they are almost always seed producing plants and uh, legume producing plants. And it's really important um, in the desert for the whole ecosystem of the desert for these uh, plants to produce these legumes for animals to eat. They're really an important food source for the animals uh, in the desert. 
And the Palo Verde is also probably one of the most uh, popular nurse plants for the saguaro cactus. So very, very important plant. The saguaro cactus depends on it. And uh, creosote bush is another common plant you'll see in the desert. Um, it's found both in the Sonoran, the Mojave, and the Chihuahuan Desert. And during the dry season, which is basically May, June, uh, probably April, May, June, part of July, probably, it loses its, uh, it loses its mature leaves, its twigs, and its branches. All that's left looks like a dead plant. But there are some small little leaves that are in the creosote bush um, that are just partially developed, and the, the plant retains those. So when the rains happen again, it's those new leaves that, uh, that kind of grow out and then can, form, can metabolize the food and deal with uh, the water and the production of uh, sugars in the leaves and photosynthesize and so the plant survives. If you go out to the desert in mid-June, mid maybe early July, you look around, you think, my God, the place is, the, everything is dead, but it's not, it's just dormant. It just everything is waiting for the for the summer rains to fall, the monsoons, and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to give a couple examples of some uh, animals that are found out in the desert and how they survive. Uh, here's a spadefoot toad. It's a famous toad in the desert. It spends about ten months underground, just waiting for the rains to fall. Amphibians breathe through their skin and their skin is moist, they need water. But uh, so what they do, they can't exist, you know, hopping around on the desert floor. So they have to, they have to protect themselves. So they dig a, dig a burrow underground and they hang out there for 10 months until the summer rains come. And then again, the summer rains have to be sufficient enough that uh, uh, this animal will, will uh, dig itself out of the burrow, come up and do its thing, which is really just reproducing. And, um, and, uh, and eating what it can and, and so forth. But they spend about 10 months on the ground. The eggs hatch after about nine hours. So they get out, they mate, they lay their eggs. And then, you know, less than a half a day, these eggs are already hatched. And then the tadpoles survive in these temporary ponds and hopefully they grow very quickly. And then it's spate back into adults. Um, they have a spade on their foot and that's where they get their name to help dig its burrow. And you can kind of see it in that picture a little bit. So what they do is they cover themselves in layers of skin. There may be seven or eight different layers of kind of loose layers of skin that um, uh, protect them while they're underground from dehydrating. But you just wouldn't think there's amphibians living in the desert, but there are and they survive and they all have strategies to, that allow them to survive out in the desert. And of course, birds. Birds are a big part of this uh, desert, so especially the Sonoran Desert. And we all know this bird, which is the roadrunner. And the way they survive really is they have wings. <laughs> and I know that sounds obvious, but it is. But they can fly from areas uh, where it's too hot. They can move to areas where it's cooler. They can get underneath the shade. Uh, we all have seen birds that have uh, puffed out in the, in the cool mornings here in Florida. Uh, they've puffed their feathers out to kind of form insulation. Uh, and what they want to do in the desert is actually compress their feathers to reduce that amount of insulation. Uh, birds are active during the hours uh, or dusk and dawn. Uh, sometimes they're active uh, during the day, but you go bird watching out in the desert, uh, you want to get up early in the morning and then you want to get out uh, uh, a little bit later in the evening when it starts to cool down. And the desert, Sonoran Desert really has two rainy seasons. It has a rainy season in the winter time when the fronts move through, like we have in Florida. Um, and then it gets very dry during the springtime and early summer. It's extraordinarily hot and dry. And then what happens is uh, the uh, moist air starts to move in from the Pacific Ocean and off of Mexico on in, in, in mid-July mid through August, September. And that's really their monsoon season where they get um, actually most of the rainfall. And what these birds do and some of these animals, but mostly birds is it's, it's, the plants start to grow and they kind of, the, the desert kind of wakes up 
and uh, the birds go into a second breeding season, why these rains are uh, these monsoon seasons. And they've had a, a few years where their monsoon season has been uh, pretty sparse. And they were going through a pretty bad drought last, last year in, uh, in around Tucson in Southeast Arizona. But they had record monsoons this past year. And uh, I was out there in August and it sure was green. It was about as green as I've ever seen it. And sometimes these rivers are so full of water that it's so loud you can't even hear the birds singing. Okay, another thing birds do is they can maintain a, a pretty high body temperature. Unlike mammals, uh, they can get their body heat up to 113 degrees and not have any problem. So their and their their bodies can fluctuate four to six degrees. You know, in a, just a matter of an hour or you know a few minutes or so forth. Um, and they can, so they can handle the heat pretty well. Uh, birds don't sweat, but they breathe through their mouth and that you see a lot of uh, uh, birds in the desert that are, have their mouth open and, and kind of cooling themselves off that way. So there's really two hummingbirds uh, that are unique to the desert, although everyone goes to the deserts to see hummingbirds. Um, but the Costas hummingbird is really the Sonoran Desert Hummingbird. Um, and the Lucifer Hummingbird is really the, the hummingbird of the Chihuahua Desert. The interesting thing is when you go out to look at hummingbirds in July and August as they're migrating through, the Costas is really a tough, tough hummingbird to find, as is the Lucifer. So they're, they're, they're desert hummingbirds, uh, they breed and then they leave. They don't stick around very long. And when these other uh, hummingbirds from these other habitats are moving through, these other biomes are moving through uh, and migrating through Arizona, the costas and the lucifers, um, a little bit tougher to find. The lucifer can stick around and sometimes it does breed a little bit later on in the summer. Uh, but they're both uh, hummingbirds that have these beautiful uh, purple feathering underneath their, on their face. <coughs> costas is kind of a short bill, a uh, short tail. Lucifer's got that long sort of decurved bill. A very common hummingbird, the Lucifer is, in Big Bad National Park in the Chihuahuan Desert. Uh, in the Sonoran Desert, though, in the summertime, and all the way into Baja, California, uh, the Costas is really the hummingbird that's the most common there. There's another hummingbird in the Sonoran Desert uh, called the Xanthus hummingbird. That uh, There's a few records in North America, but mostly it's seen in, in Baja, California. And when we were out there a few years ago in March, uh, we, had, uh, we had great looks at both the Costas and the Xanthus. And uh, they're both in full breeding plumage. And uh, boy, the Costas is a beautiful, beautiful hummingbird in breeding plumage. Um, it's got that long gorget that, that uh, hangs down from its uh, face like that. But those are the two uh, desert hummingbirds, so to speak. But there's lots of hummingbirds that pass through the desert in migration. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit and kind of finish up here uh, with a little bit about the birds of the Sonoran Desert, um, our eastern counterparts. So wherever you go in North America and you visit these different biomes, there's different birds and sometimes there's the same bird like robins, red-winged blackbirds or morning doves. And morning doves, you know, they're pretty common out in the desert. And yet you can find morning doves in the grasslands and you can find them uh, in the tundra. Well, I don't know if you can find them in the tundra, but you can find them in the, uh, on the edge of the boreal forest, the eastern forest and so forth. So when you go, what I like to do is I like to, when I go and kind of learn the birds of these areas, uh, I try to find their counterparts. So something I'm familiar with in the East that would maybe make that bird a little bit more familiar to me when I go out West. And uh, I'll give you a few examples. Um, some of these are, are classic desert birds. I think there's one that's not really a desert bird, but it, it kind of um, shows how some of the birds we have in the East, uh, um, their counterparts are very similar birds are also found in the desert. And the first is the two hawks, the, the gray hawk 
and the red-shouldered hawk. Everyone's familiar with the red-shouldered hawk here in Florida and eastern North America. Uh, the gray hawk is really kind of restricted to Texas, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and it's the, but it's a beautyo, small beautyo, about the same tie size as a red-shouldered hawk. Um, got barring on the tail like a red-shouldered hawk or similar to a red-shouldered hawk. It's mostly found around um, areas uh, of rivers and uh, riparian woodlands, so to speak. Um, but uh, uh, if you bird all day in, in Arizona, you should, you should come across gray hawks. But it's kind of the counterpart to me of the red-shouldered hawk we have here in Florida. And of course, the little owls. Can you tell me which one's the western screech owl, which one's the eastern screech owl? At one time, they were just called screech owls, and then they got split. And then they got split again into one. I think they got split again into the whiskered screech owl. So, but there are uh, two, uh, two species, of, uh, well, actually three species of screech owls, um, the western and the eastern. The one on the left side of the screen is the western screech owl, and the, the uh, brown one is the eastern screech owl. And they sound a little different, but um, uh, very common. There's, as most of you know, the eastern screech owls are very common here in Pinellas County and throughout Florida. And same with the western screech owls. If you go out birding at night, you surely shouldn't have any problem finding them. But their call's a little different and they have a little bit different, a feather pattern on their, on their chest than um, the uh, whiskered screech owl does. And of course, the flickers, the gilded flicker is on the left, the northern flicker is on the right. And what these two birds have done is they've flip flopped their mustache with their marking on the back of their head. And that's, uh, other than that, there's not a whole lot of difference between them. They both sound the same. The gilded flicker uses the swirl cactus, and the northern flicker uses uh, trees or holes in the trees. And then there's the uh, the Gila woodpecker and uh, the Gila woodpecker and the red-bellied woodpecker. The Gila is kind of uh, kind of a very drab, plain-looking woodpecker. Um, Melanerpes is the genus name, and it seems wherever you go birding, it doesn't matter if it's in North America or if it's in South America, Central America. If you have a Melanerpes woodpecker in your area. Uh, that's going to be the most common woodpecker you see. And I think that's true in Florida. I think the red belly is the most common one we see. And I would say the gila is probably the most common woodpecker you see in Arizona. And if you go to Texas, there's a golden front of woodpecker that is a Melanerpes woodpecker that is also very, very common there. So for some reason, that genus of woodpecker is very adaptable and very common. And another flicker you see out in the West is called the red shafted flicker, but that's not a flicker that's uh, found in the deserts. Um, it's really the gilded flicker. The tip mice out there, we have the tufted tip mouse and the bridal tip mouse, but the bridal tip mouse isn't really a desert tip mouse. It's a desert of, a, 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 excuse me, it's a mouse. <laughs> it's a, a bird of the, uh, of the oak pinion, um, habitat, a little bit higher up in elevation, but that's that's the common chipmouse you would see if you were to go to Southeast Arizona and go birding, would be the bridal chipmouse. It's really a pretty little chipmouse and very common. And the gray crested flycatcher, which is a, our flycatcher of the woods, uh, Eastern woods, and the brown crested flycatcher, um, um, it's a desert flycatcher. One of the desert flycatchers. The other one is the ash-throated flycatcher. Um, these are very, very similar, just kind of cousins of each other. Sometimes we get brown-crested flycatchers here in the winter time, but um, their, their counts, their uh, call sounds very similar. Uh, difficult to tell their calls apart. Um, they look almost the same, but uh, those are the two uh, uh, crested flycatchers that are found um, in in uh, one in the desert and one in the eastern. Eastern United States. There's the ash, like I said earlier, there's an ash throat of the flycatcher that's almost restricted to the desert. And then there's the um, um, I can't think of the name of the flycatcher that's found in the woods. 
a dusky cap flycatcher that's found in the woods or the woodlands of the uh, of the Sonoran Desert or the east or the southeast Arizona. Um, and those are the other two uh, flycatchers. And of course, our buntings, we got the beautiful indigo bunting and the desert has this beautiful varied bunting, which just, it's, uh, it's kind of a bird that when you look at, you really can't quite figure out what color it is because it just seems to change color when the sun hits it. But it's uh, really a, a very, very common bunting out in, the, uh, out in the desert areas, the varied bunting. And the last slide I have for you tonight is our Northern Cardinal. And then the sort of the Cardinal of the desert is called the Paraluxia. A uh, very similar type of bird. Uh, there is a, a Cardinal in Arizona called the Western Cardinal. It's not a, it's really a subspecies of the Northern Cardinal. It's, it's called the Northern Cardinal, but it's, it, it just looks a little different than the Northern Cardinal we have in the East. Uh, the Western Cardinal has a taller crest on its head. Its colors seem a little brighter red, uh, but it's not considered a separate species. But the Paraluxia is a separate species. And quite often you were looking at a feeder and you can have a, a Paraluxia feeding on one side of the feeder in, in, uh, in Arizona and a Cardinal feeding on the other side of the feeder. So even though they may um, look very similar, uh, they occupy a different niche in, in the deserts. But uh, that's, uh, that's all I have for you tonight about uh, the Sonoran Desert. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Let me go back, uh, get my screen back up here. So the, and there's one question. Uh, and uh, These are beautiful pictures. Did you take them? Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> nope. yeah. no, I'm not a photographer, no. Well, I, I learned a lot, actually. There were a lot of in interesting facts that you never know <laughs> unless you yeah. see what uh, somebody tells you. <laughs> so if there are any other questions, please they type them in your QA box. Uh, uh, So there's a question down here, Junaid. Do I uh, click on it on the yeah, Q and A sure, box? Sure, or, sure. But possibly that's the one that uh, I read to you. But uh, okay, oh, okay, okay. Uh, just about the <laughs> okay. yeah. Okay. No, no, I don't. Uh, okay, there are there are a lot of questions coming now. You can uh, keep reading them and answer them. Okay. <laughs> okay. So there was a question about Madeira Canyon. Well. Yeah, Madeira Canyon is, um, um, it's one of the most uh, beautiful places in Southeast Arizona. Um, the great thing about Madeira Canyon is you start off the bottom in grasslands and make your way through the pine uh, pinion forest, the oak, oak pine forest. Uh, you can get up to some of the taller trees. They have a stream um, that goes through uh, this, it's in the Santa Rita Mountains, um, and they have a pretty healthy population of trogons that nest there. It's one of the places where most people go to get trogons. But the number of bird species in Madeira Canyon is uh, quite impressive, and uh, it's really uh, one of my favorite places. Plus, the thing about Madeira Canyon that really is uh, fun when you go there in late summer is there's people there who are studying moths, and they'll have these moth screens set up in different places in the canyon. And uh, it's just phenomenal, the number of moths that these people, uh, uh, I don't wanna say collect, cause they don't, co some, some may collect moths or a few unique species of moths, but they use to study moths. It's really one of the most moth rich habitats uh, in North America. And people flock to Southeast Arizona in late summer just to uh, study moths. Mm. Okay, Madeline has a question about the migratory birds that uh, go through the desert. Yeah, that's an interesting question. The, um, a lot of people go to Arizona in late summer, early fall to see the migrating hummingbirds because they come through in the thousands. I'm not saying you're gonna see flocks of thousands come through, through, but 
I mean, you go visit feeders and there may be um, 20, 30 hummingbirds visiting these feeders at Madeira Canyon or Patagonia or uh, uh, different places, you know, have feeders out. Um, and I was told one time that for every hummingbird you see at a feeder, there's actually eight other ones that you don't see because these, these hummingbirds kind of move in and out all day long, grabbing, uh, uh, drinking out of the feeders and so forth. But it's, uh, yeah, there's birds that, uh, that come through in the spring and through Arizona and there's in the desert and there's birds that come through in the fall and migrate um, through that flyway. And then there's birds that winter there, just like we have in Florida, kind of mild uh, winters and so forth. Um, I'm not sure that answers your question but, uh, and Mike has a question about, aren't there jays? Um, if you go, yeah, you have to go up a little bit in elevation and you'll get the Mexican jay. They're not really found on the desert floor. And the other thing that's unique about the Sonoran Desert in Southeast Arizona is they have these sky islands. They have the Huachuca Mountains, the Catalina Mountains, the Santa Rita Mountains. And if you get up high enough, you can get uh, Stellar's Jays. Um, but there aren't really any Jays that I can think of on the desert itself. Because Jays are really um, oak. Uh, they're kind of uh, tied in with oak trees. And so acorns and so forth. And there just aren't oak trees on the desert floor. Any scrub jays over there? Uh, I know there, there are western scrub jays, <laughs> but southeast Arizona, not not so much. No, not, much. Mm -hmm. no, not so much. Uh, favorite place to bird in Arizona? Um, Jim has that question. Um, gosh, a Madeira Canyon is just great. I I just love to bird Madeira Canyon. I love Portal. Mm -hmm. uh, that's more of a Chihuahuan desert habitat than a Sonoran habitat. Um, I get, uh, yeah. If I had to go to one place, I'd go to Madeira Canyon, mm -hmm. and I'd stay there. Uh, I'd stay there for about three or four days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can travel off from there too. You don't have to just stay in the canyon. But there's uh, Montosa Canyon, another Florida Canyon. There's all these different places you can visit from there. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sylvia. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Here's your chance. Thanks a lot uh, once again, uh, Paul. It's very informative and very entertaining. Uh, hopefully, you'll come again <laughs> for the different subject. Uh, you, yeah. You, you, well, <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, as long as there's biomes, there's always something to talk about. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Uh, uh, make sure that you are getting our Wing Beat ma magazine, and also we are on uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, YouTube, uh, and uh, check our uh, uh, website uh, for upcoming field trips uh, to pick one. And also, we are looking for board members and committee members. If you are uh, into birds or conservation, or if you know anybody who is, uh, please check our uh, website and click on the Our Boards button uh, to see the available positions. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks again. Uh, thanks, Paul. You are. And uh, for making a memorable night. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye, everybody.